All right, guys, so we're going to get straight into, into things today. <clears throat> um, obviously, welcome to this Saturday session with exam revision. Today's session is going to be covering um, a very or tends to be an unpopular question with students. It's not the most interesting um, topic we cover on the Leaving Sir History course, but an extremely um, important question. And really importantly, or most importantly, it's quite an a predictable question to answer when it comes up is generally asked in the same kind of ways which we'll investigate as we go through today so today's saturday session is going to cover social and economic policies and um, under the coming Gael and Fianna Fáil governments um, over our course of partition and sovereignty in ireland so uh, just to highlight i suppose what's available to, on exam revisions website in regards to leaving our history so on their website we have <coughs> um video recorded lessons, PowerPoints, H1 standard notes, self-correcting quizzes for every single topic on the Leaving Cert History course. Um, so if I click on to um, Montgomery Bus Boycott here, you can see we have our videos available, which I'll open. All videos tend to be around 12 to anywhere between 18 to 20 minutes long, covering that topic in huge amounts of detail, more than enough detail to get you to that H1 standard. My favorite part of the website is the self-correcting quizzes that you can take after watching the video lessons or reading the notes or going through the PowerPoints. And you'll see the H1 standard notes here. Um, all notes, PowerPoints and video lessons have direct links to exam situations. Um, so it's all covered all there in one nice, neat location. Um, so for attending today's Saturday session, you can receive a discount code on Exam Revision's website for 20% off standard and premium plans. So if you use the code LEE20, you'll get 20% off those standard and premium plans on their website. Before we get into things again, I'd just like to highlight the upcoming Saturday sessions. So to the best of my knowledge, Exam Revision has Saturday sessions on most Saturdays of the year. These are obviously free hour long tutorial sessions for Leaving Cert students, not just for Leaving Cert history, but for a variety of different subjects. And um, so on the 19th of March, we have Leaving Cert Spanish coming up and um, 26th of March, Leaving Cert French. Saturday, the 2nd of April, you're back with me for Leaving Cert history. We'll be looking at and um, one of our case studies from this section of the course, the Eucharistic Congress very important exam question and um, obviously and we kind of focus on this kind of exam skill we'll call using our case studies to the best of our ability within the exams and then on April 9th we've leaving cert biology with Connor I believe so roadmap for today we're going to break today's session down into three different parts firstly we're going to actually cover the content looking at the economic and social policies of um, coming to Gwail or C CNG which I'll refer to it moving forward Next, we'll look at the economic and social policies of Fianna Fáil over this period or over a different period. Um, so we'll compare and contrast, look for um, similarities and differences between both economic and social policies. And then we'll look at both successes and failures um, of both governments over that period. And then finally, we're going to go through a detailed breakdown of a macro micro essay plan, going through every step of the way, how we write an essay um, for this very, as I said, unpopular but quite common exam question for leaving cert history students. So let's start looking at economic social pol so social policies coming to go out. So we can break this down into four different sections even further. Firstly, we'll look at their agricultural policies. Secondly, we'll look at their industrial policies. Thirdly, we'll look at their social policies. And then uh, last thing we'll do is just an assessment on Cumann na Gael. Basically, was their government a success or a failure? Or the word we're going to come back to, um, and I suppose we're just linking into an exam situation already, how effective was the Cumann na Gael government? And they can be effective and ineffective in different areas, and that's realistically um, the conclusion we're going to draw from the government. Anyway, so background info to Cumann na Gael's government. Ernest Blight was the Minister for Finance 1923. He did not have much experience um, in that field. He relied on advice from two of his civil servants. So these are key personalities that will pop up over the course of our studies here. First civil servant, Joseph Brennan. He worked for the British Treasury. He played a big role in influencing government economic policy in positions from chairman of currency commissions and the, government, uh, the governor of the Central Bank. Bank. Not important to know those kind of minute details there. What's important to understand is Joseph Brennan had a huge wealth of experience behind him. Secondly, J.J. McElliott. 
So he worked in British civil service but was sacked for taking part in the Easter Rising. Love that story. Um, Collins made him assistant secretary in the Department of Finance, managed to hold his position through multiple governments up to 1953. Think about the symbolism of that, just kind of shows um, how good he was at his job, that he held his position through multiple governments and they didn't bring someone else in to change when there was governmental change at that point. So when studying our economic and social policies here, I like to break this down. So I'll just print this on an A3 piece of paper for my students just to give you guys reference. And I'll photocopy it uh, front and back. So I'll break it down like this. So we have all the information in one place because I fully do understand my students do articulate it to me that they don't really enjoy studying this. It's not the most interesting topic, but if we can nail this, we can definitely answer a really good question on our on our leaving Sir history exam for that so the i'm going to call it like a graphic organizer okay so the graphic organizer will look like this we've the economic policies agriculture economic policies industry successes social policies failures so i'll print this on an a3 piece of paper and i'll fill it or i'll ask my students to fill in the notes so i refer to this as this is like our bible for our economic and social policies here for coming to guayle fina fall we have everything on literally one A3 page that helps us revise and we can use different revision tools around how we actually, I suppose, study this information. But when we're writing our notes, we keep it all in this one place. So I'm going to break it down like this and I'll show you what it looks like afterwards as well. So we're going to start with economic policies around agriculture. So agriculture, obviously, if we look at our photo up the top right corner in relation to farming. So agriculture was central to Cumann and Gael's Irish economic policy. So if we look at the statistics around employment in that 1.3 million people uh, or what the labor force in Ireland was 1.3 million at this point, nearly or over half of those essentially were employed in the agricultural industry. So 670,000. And if we look at, I suppose, agricultural um, contributions to, to the economy, it, it exported up to 86 percent or it made up of made up 86 percent of Ireland's exports. Um, however, it was a very vulnerable economic sector due to many weaknesses. So there was, uh, I suppose, there was no centralized plan to the to the agricultural eco economy in Ireland. There was a lot of small, unproductive farms all over the kind of rural areas of the country. So we see Patrick Hogan, Minister for Agriculture, come in under Cumann de and set up kind of five different things that would look to support agriculture over the course of Cumann de government. Firstly, he introduced the standards for production and uh, presentation of produce, produce. So we wanted to standardize the production and the presentation of Irish agricultural produce. So really just looking to up the standard of goods um, that was being produced in the country. He sent out and paid for advisors to visit Visit farms and to educate farmers and I suppose um, more advanced and more technological uh, farming practices just more efficient farming practices as we see so a huge education policy around how can we educate our farmers uh, to I suppose just start implementing best practice on their farms next he introduced the agricultural credit corporation so we wanted to provide loans specifically for farmers and he kind of centralized this under one kind of umbrella of his department in this agricultural credit corporation i like to think about it like a credit union for farmers where they can go and access loans and um, to essentially access capital to improve their farms he also set up the land commission so we want to buy land from landlords and distribute that land to farmers throughout the country so we wanted to kind of just i suppose provide incentives and encourage farmers to to grow their farms even further to sw make that switch from small and productive farms all over the country to larger farms that were i suppose kind of engaging in this high intensive farming he also introduced the land act in 1923 which forced remaining landlords to sell their unused land so hugely important to get that unused land into the hands of farmers make that switch from small unproductive farms to these high intensive uh, essentially agricultural economy in the country Ernest blight however cut the income tax and the old age pension at this time so this was an unpopular decision with farmers as income tax only benefited large corporate farms and as we talked about the most farms in ireland at this point were small unproductive farms and a lot of the farmers were in receipt of the old age pension so that's a social policy that affected the farmers themselves so that's why i've kind of included it here under agriculture we'll come back to that in a little bit more detail when i look at the social policies of coming to Guayle at this point. Economic policy, so industry on the other side of the spectrum. So when we're talking about industry, we're looking at essentially production or just if we look at the photo and the, or the little icon in the top right uh, section of our notes here, 
we're looking at factories. So what is being produced in Ireland at this point? So industry provided 60% of export earnings to the economy. So it was an important sector of the Irish economy at this time. Um, however, it was dominated by big companies such as Guinness, who exported products through the British Empire. Small industries, textiles, furniture sold within local Irish markets, and they really could not compete with the price of cheaper products that were being imported into the country. So these smaller uh, companies wanted a switch in government policy. They wanted essentially protection from foreign companies. So in order to give smaller companies protection from foreign companies, they wanted the government to introduce tax on imports, which would obviously lead to an increased price of goods that were imported from the country. This is what we call the policy of protectionism. Now, I'd highlight this, but the pen doesn't work when I'm on YouTube here, guys. Um, we're going to come back to that policy of protectionism under Fianna Fáil and how they followed suit um, and actually looked to introduce this. So big companies wanted to uphold the free trade agreements within the British Empire. So the uh, big companies, I use Guinness as an example here, um, they had free trade agreements with Britain, so they had really low tax rates when they're actually trading and exporting goods to Britain. They wanted to keep those in place um, in order to, I suppose, keep profits up in the country. So Brennan and McElligot supported the big companies in this regard. And I suppose in order to prolong the inev inevitable decision here and keep the voters on side in the smaller industries, Blight, who was Minister for Finance, set up this fiscal inquiry committee to investigate the best possible solution for this. However, this in uh, inquiry committee in the end recommends to uphold the free trade agreement and Cumann and Gwell supports, essentially what that means is Cumann and Gwell su supports the big companies rather than the small. And I'm just going to highlight here, consider the implications um, of this for the next election. So that's what I suppose we'll come back to when we look to evaluate or um, yeah, evaluate how successful um, Cumann and Gwell was in government. One of their biggest mistakes was not supporting, I suppose, smaller industries and I suppose uh, putting in place what I'm going to call social infrastructure in the country to, I suppose, improve the quality of life for the majority of uh, the population. Think about uh, lower to middle classes here. What the government was doing at this point was supporting big companies, which was supporting the rich and the upper classes. And that would obviously have implications for the next election. It would make them sort of unpopular. So small companies were not happy. However, in 1926, the government sets up the Tariff Commission to investigate requests for protection for small companies on individual goods imported on a case-by-case -case basis. So this Tariff Commission proves to be essentially useless or unhelpful, maybe useless is a bit harsh, as by 1930, very little cases had been in in investigated in the country, which just kind of highlights again the lack of support for small business and small companies um, in Ireland under Cumann and Gwell's government. We could also look to, I suppose, industry, how they introduced the Shannon Scream, uh, which introduced, which was introduced to combat the lack of cheap power in the country. So we can look to the German firm Simmons developing this electrical, electrical power grid from the Shannon River. This was a huge, I've used the word reformative piece of engineering that was completed in 1929, but it was very progressive, very ahead of its time, looking to use electrical power, hydroelectricity from the Shannon River. We can also look to the ESB, the Electricity Supply Board, and how this established one of the first national grids of electricity in Europe. So by 1939, every town in Ireland um, had a very steady electricity supply. And obviously, we, we still understand the role of the ESB in Irish society, and I suppose... Um, how that provides power to most to all of Ireland essentially <clears throat> so social policies so when we refer to social policies once again just to confirm we're all on the same page here we're looking at um, impacts on people so you can see the people icon up in the top right corner of our notes here and um, so in my opinion one of I suppose coming to Wales areas that they lacked foresight in or they lacked planning in was their social uh, policies and this is kind of what led to their uh, the change of government so while in the united kingdom the british uh, britain subsidized social welfare payments in ireland so if you just think about while ireland was under british control while we were under control of westminster the british government would subsidize so they would help pay for social welfare payments so the likes of the do dole payments old age pension and um, unemployment work schemes all of that was helped 
or all of the Irish government was helped to pay for that by the British government. So with independence, this changed, and now the free state government had to pay these payments themselves. So in 1912, the old, 1922, the Irish old age pension cost the government 3.3 million a year, while their total expenditure was limited to 20 million. Expenditure is the amount that they had to spend every year. So Cumann and Gael's desire was to keep taxes low, which meant their only choice, they kind of pigeonholed themselves in this regard, the only choice that they had to save money was to cut social welfare spending. So social welfare, just to confirm again, old age pension, unemployment work schemes, dole payments, disability payments in the country. Think about the most vulnerable in society who the social welfare uh, spending is there to support. And once again, I've just underlined and highlighted the importance of this. Think about the implications for the next election. Was this going to be a good decision? And we're going to come back to that when we look to evaluate their government. So the first budget, Blight, uh, as, as I kind of alluded to earlier, Blight cuts the old age pension from 10 shillings a week to 9 shillings a week. Once again, unpopular decision. Looking at their social policies, cutting social, social welfare spending in order to keep taxes low, they weren't really supporting the most vulnerable in society. Most vulnerable in society, lower to middle classes. Um, and I suppose if you think about it, they make up most of, um, most of uh, the people who could vote in the country. They also changed the means or the testing means or the means test, which was a test that decided what poor people were entitled to, whether it was going to be a pension or unemployment uh, pay. And essentially what they did here was just made it even harder to access the limited social welfare benefits available to most vulnerable in society. So they made it harder to access the social welfare benefits that were already being reduction, that were already being reduced. So I just think I just see that as like compounding the negative impact of that. So unpopular once again. We could also look to how there was very little or no investment in basic social infrastructure, what I referred to earlier. Infrastructure, healthcare, housing, roads, education. And to kind of top all this off, the Great Depression hits the global economy in 1929. Remember the Wall Street Wall Street crashes in 1929. American government kind of um, collapses. We see we would have studied that when we looked at the Weimar Republic and the impact that had on Weimar Germany. Think about hyperinflation. This affected the global economy. Ireland was no, um, Ireland, Ireland was not spared away from that. So Blight tries to follow other governments' lead around the world, and he cuts civil service wages. Think about guards, teachers, doctors. This was a very poor economic decision, as it did very little to help the economy recover. And it made Cumann and Gael even more unpopular. Now, to be fair to Blight, he was just following suit. That was what I suppose a global economist thought was the right thing to do at the time. But it actually made very, very little difference to the red line or how much money the government was saving during this, um, I'm going to say, global e economic crisis. Or we can refer to it as a recession, but I think it was a little bit more than that. Um, and it made Cumann and Gael even more popular with Garda, teachers, doctors, generally middle class people. So now they'd kind of cut social welfare payments to the most vulnerable in society, uh, lower classes, um, if we think about disability payments, um, the dole, uh, un unemployment schemes, and now we can see uh, cuts to civil service wages, Garda, teachers, doctors, middle classes. This was gonna have huge implications on the next general election as their popularity had de decreased essentially. So to evaluate that, we're going to break it up very simply here. Successes and failures of the com uh, of the company, the government. Um, so Cumann and Gael had success with economic policies. So exports of agricultural produce to Britain restored to pre-World War One levels. So if we think about those five aspects that were introduced by Patrick Hogan, Minister for Agriculture, he increased the standards of production and presentation of produce in Ireland. So he essentially just ensured or looked at the quality of Irish agricultural produce that was being um, produced in the country, and he wanted to standardise all that, bring it all up to a level. Um, he also set up advisors to visit farms and educate farmers into more um, efficient farming practices. He set up what I'm going to call the Credit Union for Farmers, the Agricultural Credit Corporation, providing loans specifically for farmers so they could access capital to increase um, I suppose just to increase the infrastructure and, and the technology they had available on the farm. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry guys, he set up the land commission to buy land from farmers and distribute that to farmers throughout the country. Really looking to focus on 
um, switching the means of farming in the country. So switching from small, unproductive, family-run farms to larger farms that we're going to engage in what I'm going to call high-intensive farming practices, so producing more produce to sell. We can also look at how um, industrial employment rises approximately five by 5,000 people over the course of 1926 to 1930, so 5,000 new jobs created in that regard. What was successful was that the government manages to cut spending and balance its budget. Think about the, I suppose, political landscape of the time. This is a new country. Irish Free State was a new country at this time. This is the first government in charge. And all eyes were on the Free State. So people were looking at, I suppose, the Irish government and the Irish people, the Irish country. Could they govern and could they run themselves successfully? And that was a question that I suppose um, this government really had to try and focus on answering. And this was an impressive feat, being able to balance that budget. We've seen the very, the very, very limited um, expenditure that they had to spell. They only had 20 million to spend. And, you know, their social welfare payments of that was 3.3 million. They didn't want to cut taxes, so they cut this, uh, cut cut their spending by reducing social um, social benefit uh Social benefit payments. Um, this was an impressive fee. People looking from the outside in, now they could see this government kind of knew what they were doing. They, they kind of proved to the world, look, we can balance our budget here. We can run ourselves economically. And what's I'm going to highlight, if I could highlight this, I would. It proved to the global political landscape, the Irish Free State was capable of independence. And that's so important. That was one of the key roles Cumann Aguil, or I suppose, Cumann Aguil had identified uh like objectives as their government. They wanted to prove to the world that they were capable of independence. And that's what they've done with these economic policies. However, failures, low tax and low government spending policy was unpopular with large proportions of society, especially with the lower classes and the middle classes who held the majority of the votes in the country. Once again, think back to those social policies. Reduction in um, social welfare payments, old age pension cut, uh, social uh, unemployment schemes cut, dole payments cut, and um, that had huge implications for the most vulnerable in society. And then we can also see with the Great Depression in 1929, Ernest Blight follows the other government's decisions around the world to cut civil service wages. Garda teachers, doctors, middle classes, very poor economic decision, did not help the economy, and it made Cumann Gwell even more unpopular in the country. We can also look to a failure as policies, although successful in establishing the Irish Free State as a new nation, made Cumann Aguil unpopular and turned out to be a deciding factor in the loss of the 1932 general election, where we'll see Fianna Fáil come into power. And that's where we switch um, our focus now and we're going to evaluate the other or the opposition party as they take power, Fianna Fáil at that point. Just to show you what the notes would look like at this point. So as I said, I'll print this out on an A3 front and back. I have... Apologies, coming to Gwail on one side, Fianna Fáil on the other, and my students will have all this these notes in the one place, ready to go. And this is what we refer to as our Bible around economic and social policies. Um, so that's just kind of important to understand, I, I suppose. Okay, so Fianna Fáil will assess the same areas. So it makes it very, very easy to compare, contrast, pick out very similar uh, similarity between policies, differences between policies, and it allows us to evaluate successes, successes and failures between the two governments over essentially a 16-year period, 1923 to 1939. So firstly, we look at agricultural policies. Secondly, industrial policies. Thirdly, social policies. Finally, assessment, success or failures. And after that, I'm going to show you directly where this fits into an exam situation. So background information. Sean McAtee was the Minister for Finance, 1932 to 1939. He imposed tariffs um, on imports, tariffs being taxes. So he agreed with small business. Now he's going to tax imports into the country and increase taxes. Secondly, we have Sean Lamas, who was a uh, Minister for Industry and Commerce. So he was in charge of developing Irish industry to fulfil the local Irish market. Extremely successful ma uh, minister, would later serve as Taoiseach. So he's very young in his political career at this point. And we have James Ryan, Minister for Agriculture. Fianna Fáil did not prioritise the development of agriculture. Um, and I suppose this was reflected in the effects of the economic war with Britain on the economic sector. So he introduced this idea of self-sufficiency, which failed miserably. Um, but would would actually become important when it comes to the context of World War II, ironically. And um, I'll touch back on this economic war at a later point with Britain. Okay, same difference, or uh, yeah, essentially same difference. Uh, so we have our 
graphic organizer here. So how I set up my notes around this is exactly the same. So it gives us very, very distinct and key areas that we can compare and contrast between um, between the two different governments. So Fianna Fáil and then obviously thereafter, coming or coming to Wales and obviously thereafter Fianna Fáil. So let's start looking at economic policies. <clears throat> Sorry, he's having a sip of water. So Great Depression hits in 1929. This cuts the demand for agric agricultural produce in Britain. As a result of this, value of Irish agricultural exports fall from 47 million in 29 to 18 million in 34. Think about the significance of that drop in terms of the economy. Think about how much money the Irish economy is losing as a result of that over a five year period. As I said, I referred to the Great Depression. It's a recession on steroids. It was a huge global economic crisis. So in order to, I suppose, pay for this or to make up that money, Ryan introduces uh, three or four different initiatives looking to combat this. So firstly, he offers, subsidi he offers subsidies to cattle farmers and begins to buy animals to generate income. So he wanted to see this um, switch to essentially um, tillage farming from arable farming. So he wanted to uh, see farmers switch from, you know, farming cattle to actually farming crops more profitable so he guaranteed prices for wheat and sugar beet however these initiatives had very little impact in limiting the damage to the agricultural economy so by 19 uh, 1931 only 10 percent more land had been switched to tillage farming so tillage being crop farming and small farmers suffered while policy supported big commercial farms so what that essentially did was widen the gap between the top and the bottom in agriculture so the gap became bigger between small, think about family run farms who really struggled during this period to those high intensive, large scale productive farms. Um, that was essentially like corp corporate farms, I'll call them. And um, we see a huge gap between the top and the bottom. He also cut the annuities payments, which supported smaller farmers. Um, and all these policies were paid for by raising taxes. So this also resulted in a rise in the cost of living for urban consumers. And this affected the poorest in society most. When I say the rise of cost of living, obviously the Great Depression affecting the agricultural market or the agricultural economy in Ireland like this, um, what it resulted for what it resulted in on the everyday person was the rising cost of food in Ireland. And that's how we see a rise in cost of living. And that obviously affected the poorest in society most who wouldn't be able to afford that food moving forward. Industrial policies. So Fianna Fáil wanted to follow a policy of protectionist, so that policy of protectionism, and they wanted to encourage the growth of Irish businesses. So what to do that, what we're going to see do, uh, Sean Lamas do is introduce tariffs or taxes um, on thousands of imported goods. So he wanted to essentially uh, increase the cost of goods that were produced outside of Ireland to encourage Irish people to buy Irish goods, shop local essentially. So Lamas encourages Irish manufacturing companies to set up in order to serve the Irish market only. So they would not export their goods, footwear, uh, textiles, furniture. So between 1931, the industrial output rose from 55 million to 90 million and created 11,000 jobs in Ireland. Huge success, 11,000 jobs over seven years. What I'm gonna to highlight to you now, and I might come back to it, these were new jobs in new industries, like footwear, for example. So these weren't just jobs that were there before. New jobs and new industries, that's important. So he also introduced this Control of Manufacturers Act, um, which states that all new companies must be Irish owned. And I suppose this was a policy that was introduced to look to protect Irish businesses. He didn't want foreign companies coming in and setting up in Ireland. He wanted Irish owned businesses that were set up just to serve the Irish market or the Irish people. Think about Irish people buying Irish goods from Irish people. That's that policy of protectionism. He also set up the industrial credit company to provide loans to companies to get started in the Irish market. Once again, think about that as a credit union for Irish owned uh, companies. So they could get up loans, they could get capital from the government to encourage them setting up in the Irish market. He also set up this idea of semi-state companies which allowed to develop, uh, which allowed essentially larger scale companies to support larger projects. So we, like he, intro he introduced this idea of Aer Lingus, which is partly owned by the Irish government. 
So Aer Lingus is a larger scale project or a larger scale company, more of a corporate company, which is semi-owned by the Irish government. So we wanted these Irish-owned industry at both small scale levels. Think about small businesses and kind of corporate businesses like Aer Lingus. So Lamas was happy to give Irish company monopolies over the market. But this drove up the price of good and lowered the quality due to less competition. That's important to understand as well. How did this impact the everyday person? Drove up the price of goods and it lowered the quality due to less competition. Let's evaluate their social policies. So there was more focus on development of social policies than coming to Gwail. So Fianna Fáil recognised the importance of this in relation to voting and that's going to be important to understand. They recognised the importance of this social infrastructure in order to, I suppose, support them democratically, get them through the elections. So 1933, we see the Unemployment Assistance Act introduced, increased unemployment benefits and extended them to farmers. Think about the opposite of that under Cumann de Gwael, how they reduced unemployment benefits to people and how that impacted farmers. Think about the cuts to the old age pension. Now we'll see Fianna Fáil go the opposite direction there and look to support them even further. They also introduced the Health Insurance Act 1933, improved health insurance in Irish society. So now people would have more access to health care, more access um, to health infrastructure in the country, supporting the most vulnerable people in society. We also see old age pensions improve. Um, so they introduced the introduction of pensions for widows and orphans. Uh, this is an extremely um popular introduction if we think about how that was supporting the most vulnerable in society widows and orphans really really and um, popular policy introduced by Fianna Fáil at the time they also invested in housing um so 1932 housing act 10 million invested to help local county councils build 12,000 houses a year in comparison to the 2,000 a year that was built under coming to Gwell. and they also improved conditions in urban slums created jobs in the building industry by commissioning work so huge focus on the development of this social infrastructure, unemployment benefits, health benefits, housing, um, and I suppose you could kind of touch upon education there as well. Okay, let's evaluate the successes and failures of Fianna Fáil. So successes, so there's an increased people working in industry. So between 1931 to 1939, we see the number of people working in, in, in industrial areas of the economy, so production or factories, we see that increase by 55,000 from 110,000 to 165,000 over a set eight year period. We see the Coal Cattle Act, which raised the quota um, of Irish cattle allowed into Britain by a third. And the Free State took another 125, 1,250,000 tons of British coal, which eases the economic war between the two countries. Now, I did kind of gloss over this idea of the economic war. Um, I'll maybe briefly touch upon it now. Um, but this economic war was essentially a war that took place between um, De Valera's Fianna Fáil and the British government at the time. Um, and it was essentially over these land annuity payments that De Valera refused to pay the British government. So this started an economic war between the two countries where I suppose trade relations broke down. However, this economic war ended before World War II began. Um, and I suppose part of the settlement was... I don't know, a final resolution of the issue that had essentially was started the economic war. So the government of ERA, and this is interesting, so first time that I suppose the government of ERA, as it was called on the final text, the document produced by the British government, agreed to pay a £10 million lump sum as a final settlement of the land annuities issue that had kind of started the economic war. So remember, I briefly touched upon it. Eamon de Valera and Fianna Fáil refused to pay the land and annuity payments to Britain. That started the economic war. We see trade relations kind of break down. The resolution to the war was de, uh, de Valera agreeing to pay 10 million lump sum as this final settlement of the land annuities issue. And I suppose if you just consider the overall cost of the land annuities that are estimated to be as high as I think around 100 million pounds, that's how much I suppose de Valera and the Fianna Fáil government were due to pay Britain over that period as a result of the land annuities issue. The final sum that de Valera paid, obviously being £10 million, absolutely outweighed the economic hit that was suffered by the Irish eco economy at that time. So for me, essentially, my opinion, Fianna Fáil had secured a 
essentially their government a really good deal at this time. Now I know I briefly touched upon that there. Anyway, we have the <coughs> 1938 Anglo-Irish Agreement. So this would have came in after the economic war had been settled. And Britain gives Irish agricultural produce privileged access to the British market. And Ireland did the same for British coal. They're in, um, I suppose, just to kind of conclude their successes of their economic policies or yeah their economic policies the industrial policy was more effective than the agricultural which was the complete opposite to coming well now i'm going to go through a detailed essay plan and how we'll use that in an essay plan but that's important to understand industrial policies were more important or uh, were more effective that's going to be our keyword i'll come back to it than their agricultural policies and as i kind of alluded to earlier not only did they create jobs Fianna Fáil created new jobs, which is a, essentially a compounding win or a double win in economical terms. Failures, however, wages remained low. So 49% lower than British average. So you're getting paid 50% lower than you would in Britain for doing the same job. Think about the consequences of that um, and think about those consequences in the terms of emigration. So it made it very attractive to emigrate to Britain. And I've just got added the word here culture of emigration i'd highlight that if i could but that contributed to the historical cultural culture of emigration in irish history or irish society and we could link that all the way back to the famine and where we see this huge exodus or huge exit of irish people to places like britain america as a result of the low wages and poor quality of life um experience in the country and that's important to understand and we have some statistics to back this up so emigration resumed after the great depression so in 1937 alone 26,000 people emigrated what we could also look as a failure is that these new end industries would not survive in an open market so essentially and i have it in bold here the protectionist policies were not sustainable long term and I'm going to fast forward if we think about just Irish history. Think about EU membership, okay? The whole benefit of being in the EU is this, I suppose, access to this huge market where trade can take place between different member states. Would obviously, I suppose, to make it very, very simple, with agreements in place between countries that, I suppose, lower taxes on exported and Im imported goods between EU member states. So this protectionist policies of looking to develop Irish owned businesses and that don't export goods and tax and in, and introduce high tariffs or taxes on imported goods wasn't going wasn't going to be sustainable long term and it doesn't fit into the the ideology of the European Union which is important to understand also Ireland now I'm get down a rabbit hole here but Ireland is just way too small of a country to follow this protectionist policy or this idea of self-sufficiency and that's important to understand so this nationalistic self-sufficiency agricultural policies made Fianna Fáil realize Ireland had to interact with foreign trade and investment especially with Britain and that's important to understand however what's interesting to think about this kind of switch to this idea of self-sufficiency so producing enough goods to feed yourself not relying on imported goods would would actually come to be important as world war ii breaks out obviously wars going on global economy is affected trade is affected imported goods is hugely affected and um, we see like the ability to switch to some sort of a self-sufficient agricultural economy was hugely important at that time anyway that's more of when we look at i suppose world war ii the the experience of life in world war ii in ireland Okay, links to an exam. So I'm just going to show you three questions and just look how similar these questions are. So I know the information isn't as interesting as some of the topics that we cover, but for me, it's very, very digestible. It's very, very easy to remember. Um, and as you'll see, the questions that come up are very, very similar, very, very easy to answer. Um, and what I like about social and economic policies uh, for students from a student's perspective is that it's very very black and white like it would the economic policy was either a success or a failure here's the statistics to back that up and that's providing analysis so i'll always go back to that phrase in history so leaving her leaving sir history students we're not asking you to tell the story we're not asking you to provide narrative we're asking you to uh, we're asking you to analyze historical events so i don't want to hear the story of history and the economic and social questions, I put a heavy emphasis on them with my students because um, it's very, very black and white. Here's the facts around it. 
here's the statistics to back it up and that's actually providing analysis to the situation and that's important it's very very easy to evaluate how effective an economic policy was because how much money did it create while it's harder to understand for example maybe solidifying democracy that's harder to understand as very very subjective and there's not essentially like there's not statistics facts or data to support your writer their writings claims at that point anyway that's why i like these economic and social policy questions let's have a look at how these are ans asked in the past so during the night about our peel paragraph approach that's the word we're going to be linking in every single paragraph come and well had an effective agricultural policy and that's what we're going to be coming back to how well did Irish governments cope with the social and economic problems they faced 1923 to 1945? Same question. Cope is the word we'd be talking about. The Cumann Aguil coped well with their agricultural uh, policies as they looked to increase the number of exports to Britain through um, Patrick Hogan's initiatives or something along those lines. During the period 1922 to 1939, how successful were Irish governments in responding to the economic challenges they faced? And when we deal with economic issues, it's almost second nature that we talk about the social um, impacts of those. How did that affect the people in the country? That's really important. Okay, let's have a look at our essay plan. <clears throat> so I'm going to deal with the first question I talked about there. <clears throat> Sorry, apologies. During the period 1923 to 1945, how effectively, effectively did Irish governments tackle the social and economic problems they faced? Now, so what I'm going to refer to here is I'm obviously just presuming that people attending or people watching would have watched uh, an earlier session that I done. I just recommend going and watch it around um, strategies to improve essay writing at Leaving Sir History. I covered it in November, so it's on Exam Revisions YouTube huge detailed breakdown of how i i suppose tackle essay writing at leaving cert history how i plan for essays and um, different levels of planning macro and micro planning how i structure each paragraph so within each paragraph i'm looking for students to do six different things and then we follow a peel paragraph approach make a point explain it provide evidence link it back to the exam question all that is covered in a hugely important Saturday session that it's just an hour watch now and I give you multiple examples of how I write paragraphs, how I use macro and micro level plans and appeal paragraph approach to write that. It's a very structured approach to essay writing um, and if you have watched that, it will have benefited you here in this regard when I go through this essay plan. So planning at a, mac uh, a macro level, which we're looking at, is essentially planning big picture. So I'm just planning the topics of my paragraphs. Now a goal for my students at the end of sixth year is that they have, you know, we're not answering specific exam questions. We just have exam topics. So economic and social problems, Fianna Fáil, Cumann Gael is our exam topic. And we can adapt the keywords around it. So it, this one might deal with effectively. And it might come up this year where we'd say, how did they cope? They're the keywords we'll have to ingrain throughout our essay. But my students will have their macro plan and from this macro plan they'll be able to get a whole and um, hopefully h1 standard leaving their essay from that five to six pages of very very structured uh historical writing anyway i've went off track let's just get back focused so for each paragraph some like i expect students to write 10 paragraphs now if you watch that saturday session you'll understand why we go through the marking scheme we talk about how the marking scheme essentially doesn't tell us but if we use the marking scheme to our benefit writing 10 paragraphs is what i call the sweet spot so you'll pick up the most marks in doing that anyway i'm not getting into it now if you go watch that and um, you'll find out so we write 10 paragraphs intro conclusion eight paragraph topics so the first paragraph here we have agricultural economic policies coming to well industrial economic policies coming to well third paragraph social policies fourth agricultural economic policies fina fall fifth industrial economic policies fina fall six social policies fina fall seven comparison of successes eight comparison of failures and i'm going to go through each paragraph at a micro level so fine detail level so for our intro once again i, I call this like our our formula to write an introduction at leaving sir history for our intro we're looking to do four things so we include a quote to introduce the essay and demonstrate evidence of outside reading 
that we should be trying to dev demonstrate evidence of wide reading throughout our essay. I recommend essentially in every second paragraph we should have a quote from um, outside reading. Maybe that be that might be in a historian. It might be from a key personality at that time. You might include a quote from Eamon de Valera at that time when you're talking about uh, the economic war or um, you might include a quote from Sean Lamas on his economic policies. In this essay, I actually think I include a quote to start off on by Roosevelt around the importance of you know social policies or strong social infrastructure in your in your economic policies to support the people in the in the economy. Now anyway, I might come back to that at a later point. So four things we're looking to do at an introduction include a quote, react to the essay question. That's really important. So if we're reacting to this question, we should be using the word effectively. Irish government's social and economic problems. So I might use a phrase like um, Irish governments over the period from 1923 to 1945 effectively dealt with different sectors of both social and economic problems that they faced. Then I'm going to state the main arguments of the essay. And I'll explain the approach. So firstly, I'm going to discuss the effectiveness of Cumann and Wales agricultural policies. Secondly, I will outline how effective Cumann and Wales industrial policies were, etc. Thirdly, I will discuss um, the effectiveness or uh, the ineffectiveness of Cumann and Wales social policies or something along those lines. So within our micro plans, we obviously have our uh, essay topic on the left. Now, I'm going to just scan my mouse over this, so I hope you can see that. We have our essay or our paragraph topic on the left column, and then we have a small set of micro plans or micro questions that are going to help us pick up full marks in terms of our CM, so our cumulative mark within that paragraph. So firstly, you outline how many people in the workforce were employed in agriculture. Explain why agricultural industry was vulnerable. Think about that idea of small, unproductive, family-run farms. State two out of four policies introduced by Patrick Hogan, Minister for Finance. There you might talk about um, Hogan's introduction of, you know, standardizing the presentation and production of goods. You might talk about the credit union set up for farmers or something along those lines. Explain the impact of Ernest Bight's decision to cut income tax and old age pensions for farmers. So it affected the smaller uh more vulnerable, lower class farmers who ran small, unproductive farms compared to, I suppose, didn't affect the, the large scale farmers or uh, the rich farmers, essentially. Industrial economic policies. So explain why industry was important to Irish economy in relation to export earnings. Describe the nature of large industry and small industry in Ireland. So literally just outline what large industry was, what small industry was. Outline the decision made by Brennan and McElligot to support large industry in Ireland over this idea of protectionism. So you should make reference to the Fiscal Inquiry Committee there. Um, and essentially how that was an unpopular decision might be a good place to go, how it supported large industry and didn't look towards supporting Irish-owned industry. Explain why the Tariff Commission was set up and its role in the Irish economy. So when you're looking at that tariff commission i suppose what's important is that it was set up to investigate requests for protection for small companies and individual goods and um, however it was set up it was going to look at it by a case-by-case -case basis and what you should be saying there is essentially it was very unhelpful um to small businesses in ireland as very little um cases were actually investigated by the committee Paragraph three, so we've industrial policies by Cumann and Gwail. So explain why the government now had to pay social welfare payments in Ireland. Talk about the free state gaining its independence, Britain subsidising those payments and how that would now change. Outline how much the old age pension cost the government, 3.3 million. State the government's total year expenditure. State why or what the go or how the government... No, just state what the government's total year expenditure was limited to. So it was 20 million. So think about the impact of essentially three and a half of that being already gone in social welfare payments. The government didn't want to increase the amount of tax that were people were paying. So they pigeonholed themselves. They had to cut social welfare. Yeah, so I already explained that. So why it's coming to well had to cut social welfare spending. They wanted to keep taxes low. State how much the old age pension was cut by and the detail the changes made to the means test. So the means test being... Uh, the test that was taken by people, I suppose, on their ability to access social welfare payments. Discuss whether these pop policies were, unpop were popular. They were not popular. They were, they were unpopular as they didn't support um, 
the most vulnerable people in society. Paragraph four, we've agricultural economic policies, Fianna Fáil. So outline the impact of the Great Depression on the agricultural demand in Britain. It decreased. Stay how much agricultural exports fell from the years 1929 to 1934. So those agricultural exports fell by, I think it was from 47 million to 18 million. Um, Name three policies introduced by Ryan to combat the Great Depression on the agricultural industry. So think about the subsidies to cattle farmers. He wanted to encourage this switch from cattle farming to tillage farming. Um, and he guaranteed prices for wheat and sugar beet as a result of that. So he wanted farmers producing crops, not farmers producing like cattle or milk and cheese. Um, explain the impact of these policies on farmers. It essentially widened the gap between large and small scale farmers. So those policies affected the small family run farms, didn't really affect the large scale corporate farms. Describe how Fianna Fáil funded these policies and the impact of this decision. So they were all funded by raising taxes. Um, but the impact of that was that it increased the cost of living for urban consumers. More importantly, to understand, it affected the poorest in society most, as the poorer people in cities, the price of food increased in the cities, their wages didn't increase, wages were kept extremely low, reduced the amount of disposable income they had. So, for example, the, the cost of a sliced pan of bread had increased, but this, the people's wages hadn't. So that was an extremely important part of that to understand. Industrial economic policy, so describe why Fianna Fáil followed a protectionist policy. Um, think about that policy of protection, obviously looking to protect Irish industry tax imported goods. State what was heavily taxed during the 1932 to 1933 budget. It was imported goods. Explain how much industrial output rose by between 1931 and 38 and how many jobs were created in the industrial economy. 11,000 new jobs in new industries such as footwear. So now... The Irish government wasn't looking to import footwear for people to buy. They were looking for Irish-owned businesses to set up companies and support that. So it increased the number of people, the number of jobs available, and they were new jobs to the Irish people. Describe two policies introduced by Sean Lamas to support this. So Sean Lamas introduced uh, the Control of Manufacturers Act. So stating that all new companies who set up in Ireland must be Irish owned. So you couldn't come in as a foreign company and set up Ireland. He also introduced the industrial credit company. So a credit company for a credit union for Irish owned businesses to get loans, increase the capital they had available to them. And he also introduced that idea of semi-state companies, Aer Lingus, half owned by a corporation, half owned by the Irish government. Um, social policies by Fianna Fáil. So state whether Come to Gael or Fianna Fáil, focus more on social policies. Explain why development of social policies is important in relation to voting. And explain three social policies introduced by Fianna Fáil over this. Unemployment Assistance Act, Health Insurance Act, House, Housing Insurance Act. And I, I forgot to include a point there. Think about how this, um, think about the implications on the, of this for the general elections and for voting in general. It would make the party popular supporting the people comparison of successes so state the successes of coming to Gwale. so focus on the economic policies here agricultural exports to britain increase rise in industrial employment they increase five thousand more people working in industry in ireland under their reign uh, cut spending and balance the budget look at the talk about the implications of that on the the geopolitical landscape so countries looking in at ireland newly founded country oh wow they're actually balancing their budget here they're actually making sound economic decisions. Maybe these people can have independence. Maybe they can govern themselves. Outline the impact of coming to economic policies. So prove to the, oh yeah, I kind of talked about, talked about that. Prove to the geopolitical landscape, free state was capable of independence. Number three, state successes of Fianna Fáil's industrial policy. So it increased people working in industry. Not only did it create jobs, they created new jobs, 11,000 new jobs in industry, such as footwear. Comparison of failures. So state failures of coming to Focus on the social policies. Low taxes, government spending policy was unpopular because they reduced the amount of social when social welfare benefits available to the population. This was especially unpopular in lower classes, which held majority of votes. And then outlined the impact of coming to well social policies. This was possibly the, the deciding factor in the loss of the 1932 general election. State failure of Fianna Fáil, so wages remained low. Talk about the impact of that on emigration. So we see 26,000 people emigrate in 1937 at the end of the economic war. Um, protectionist policies were not sustainable. Once again, you could touch upon the idea of 
or the overarching idea of the European Union there and how, you know, those protectionist policies goes against the basic principles of the European Union, which is, I suppose, cooperation agreements and trade between member countries. Um, and then you could talk about the self-sufficient agricultural policies, how they were a failure. Um, but you could also touch upon that idea of how, you know, farmers gaining experience in those self-sufficient agricultural practices, producing enough goods to feed your own population would be important when we switch to a wartime economy in World War II. There's nothing wrong with having the foresight to touch upon uh, the context of the events that we're talking about, what's happening in the future there. And then four, outline impacts of Fianna Fáil's policies. And I just love that, you know, how that contributed to the historic culture of emigration in Ireland. That'd be a great phrase to include in your essay there. I think that's really, really high order thinking. You're thinking about the impact of that on um, the bigger picture, the macro picture of emigration and that culture of emigration we have in Ireland that dates back all the way to the famine. And then conclusion. So I f call this our conclusion um, formula. Restate the main ideas. When one considers how effective the or the effectiveness of both Fianna Fáil and Cumann Quail's Cumann Aguil government's economic and social policies, both governments had successes in some industries with failures in the other. Answer the so what to explain why any of this matters, why the reader should care. Think about the significance of this to that historic culture of emigration in Ireland. Think about the significance of um, Ireland proving to the world that the geopolitical landscape is a good phrase, that the free state was now capable of independence, that they were capable to govern themselves. That's why the reader should care. So then you should include a kicker or lingering thought. So the last sentence should leave the reader nodding in agreement and feeling glad that they bothered to read your essay. And I always just say, if you're stuck here, and use a famous quote that connects your ideas in the previous sentences. So last thing before I finish up, guys, we're just at the hour there. Once again, I'll just kind of go through really quickly what's available on Exam Revision's website. We have pre-recorded lesson videos of every single topic on the Leaving Cert history course. And um, we've self-correcting quizzes, H1 standard notes, and PowerPoints available all ready to be used, all ready to be accessed um, via that platform. I won't go into too much detail there. And um, once again, I'll highlight the discount code. So it's Lee 20, it'll get you 20% off those standard and premium plans on the website. And last thing before I finish up guys is just to highlight the upcoming Saturday sessions again. So next week we have Leaving Cert Spanish, following week we've Leaving Cert French. Three weeks time we're back with me, Leaving Cert History, looking at the Eucharistic Congress. Um, one of our case studies from this section of the course, hugely important, huge implications for an exam situation for you. This question is very, very common. And then we have Leaving Cert Biology the 9th of April. I'm going to leave it there, folks. Thanks so much for the hour on a Saturday morning, and I'll speak to you soon.